Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so uh, keeping the topic slight, uh, after uh, a talk on read copy update, I'm going to discuss restartable sequences. So um, my name is Mathieu Denoyer. I am a CEO at uh, Efficious. I do uh, mainly kernel and user space tracing with LTTNG, but I also uh, um, am a maintainer of the uh, co-maintainer of the restartable sequence uh, system call and membarrier system call in the Linux kernel. So, so whatever I do, I mainly do for the sake of speeding up the, my user space tracer. But I keep in mind other use cases, such as memory allocators, which is the one I'm going to target mostly today. So this presentation is about uh, an improvement or an extension to a restartable sequence, uh, which is to add a scheduler-aware uh, uh, scaling of memory use on many core systems. Yeah, so let's, yeah. Okay, a uh, quick outline of uh, this presentation. So I'm going to quickly brief you about uh, the, the RSEC use and ad adoption status at the moment, uh, discuss the next steps, introduce the per memory space virtual CPU ID RSEC extension, uh, discuss the impact on scheduler context switching, uh, present benchmarks, sketch stat profiling, discuss new aspects, uh, and then open the discussion. By the way, uh, please ask questions during the talk. No problem there. And uh, I think it's, it's good to, to clarify things uh, as, as we go. So the current stages, uh, the architectures supporting the sysrsec uh, system call uh, are, so all of those architectures that have 3264-bit, it's supported on both. So uh, ARM, MIPS, Power, RISC-V, S390, and 86, XC86. Um, CSKY and Long, Long Arc have RSEC system, the, the RSEC system call implemented. However, they never provided any code for the self-tests, which I don't really like. Uh, so I asked the CSKY maintainer to provide that. Uh, so he should do, be doing that soon. Long Arc, it's, it's unclear whether they, they will pre be providing that. So personally, as a maintainer, I prefer to have RSEC not available in an architecture so that user space can have a, a, a fallback that works well and know that when our sec is there, it's good. So, so yeah. Uh, in the GNUC library in version 2.35, our sec has been, uh, the our sec support has been added and it's being used to implement sked get CPU and uh, they get nice uh, speed ups, especially on architectures like ARM64, where SCADGET CPU is not implemented as a VDSO, so you go from a full system call to a load in user space. So it's a nice improvement. Uh, there are other use cases being discussed, uh, mainly memory allocators. Uh, so there's TC malloc, a project uh, from Google, which uh, uses RSEC now, the RSEC system call. Uh, they, they, they've been using their own internal RSEC before. Uh, uh, CRIU uh, supports RSEC now, Dynamo Rio as well. Um, so, yes. So get CPU, uh, I guess like, so it's a memory load uh, what can concurrently modify the CPU number? Like, isn't it always fixed or is it hot plug? It's uh, the kernel. So the kernel, as it migrates the thread, is go so, so, oh, so yeah. after migration, so migration raises a flag, then you get to uh, resume to user space. At that point, you can take page faults. So at that point, the kernel ups, updates the content of this per thread area. Okay, so now you can directly read it from user space. Yeah, so whenever user space then loads the value, then it's the updated value. Okay, got it, thanks. Welcome. So next steps, uh, targeting use cases, memory allocators, ring buffers, tracing everyone, yes. Uh, counters, I've, uh, so we, we have new features coming in LTTNG, which is based on counters, so, and I plan to make use of uh, RSEC uh, pretty soon for that. That's gonna be nice, uh, nice performance improvements. Um, and generally, RSEC remove, uh, can be used to remove the need. Okay, so, so next step, just a bit of context. So when designing things like memory allocators, 
you basically currently have to choose between a global, you're in user space, you're in the process. You want to choose between, let's say, a global, global arena with locking. Uh, if you have very few threads, that might be a nice trade-off. Uh, uses fewer memory. Or you go for per thread. But then uh, with per thread pools, you have nice locality when you allocate. But then as your threads, uh, number of thread is going beyond the number of cores, then you're, you start to waste memory. Uh, compared to having a per core approach where you would like to have ideally per core uh, uh, memory arenas to allocate from free lists, right? Um, so what I'm going to present today removes, removes the entire need to choose between those three. More on that coming. Uh, some use case, uh, per, so when you use RSEC, RSEC is good for doing per CPU data accesses. But the thing is, per CPU data in user space, if you are in, a, let's say, in a single threaded application, you're wasting memory. I mean, you allocate per, per core data structures, but then you have only one thread, which might be freely being migrated uh, between all those cores, if it's not defined. And uh, yeah, you're, you're, you're bad at locality and you're wasting memory. Uh, the other use case is per CPU data memory uh, use when using CPU sets on many core systems. So let's say you have a big system, let's say, I don't know, 256 cores, but then it's, it, it's fragmented into small CPU sets, small containers. Each container has a full view of all the, the 256 cores on the system. So if you go for a, a per CPU data allocation, you'll allocate 256 uh, entries, right? So again, that's pretty bad. Because, I mean, that, you, could, you could be using CPU sets to limit each container to maybe four cores. So here comes the per memory space virtual CPU ID resortable sequence extension. So I did not came up with this uh, idea by actually uh, Paul Turner was uh, discussing it with me in, at uh, Plumbers 2019, and this was actually my last Plumbers, so I first travel in three years. Um, so the idea there is to allocate virtual CPU IDs within a process which can be limited by the number of threads which are running concurrently. Okay, so let's say you are a process, and there's only two threads, and you want to index per CPU data. Well, you, you'd, you'd be good enough with uh, index zero and one because you only have two threads at most running, right? Uh, and whether it's because there's only two threads in the process or because that process is always affined to only two cores, I mean, globally in the system, you only have two entities running concurrently. So you just need really two entries in terms of per CPU data structures. You just need to make sure that whenever two threads from that process run concurrently, they never think that they have the same ID. They each need to have uh, their own tem temporarily unique ID, right? So uh, the Google implementation was never made available. So uh, last February, I took time to implement it myself and see what I could come up with. So I have the link to uh, the, the, the patch set uh, in, the, in the references at, at the end of, uh, of these slides. So um, one change that is needed in addition to expose additional fields to the struct RSEC ABI that's exposed to user space. So, so how I plan to extend this is not the topic of this talk. Uh, uh, but uh, this has been discussed with the Glibc maintainers and they were, they seem to be happy with it. So, uh, but yeah, we focus here on the modifications to the scheduler that are needed. So I extended the scheduler to uh, continuously track, so ongoing, uh, track the number of threads that run concurrently on behalf of each uh, memory space, uh, MM short for memory space. Usually people call that a process, but I mean, there's clone VM, so using clone, you could create things that kind of share a MM. I mean, there are weird cases. So, so really, it's a memory space. So uh, when the scheduler switches to a uh, switches to a new thread, 
uh, to a thread, not necessarily new, it doesn't, not just created. That thread is assigned a VCPU ID, which is guaranteed to be unused by any other thread from the same memory space until the thread is scheduled out. So you have exclusive access to your per CPU data. That's what it means. This can be done with a uh, per memory space bitmap, which I call a MM vCPU mask. Uh, so, and its max number of bit is limited, is bounded by the number of possible CPUs on the system. Uh, the updates are atomic operations, atomic bit test and set and atomic bit clear. So uh, we have to be careful about adding atomic uh, uh, operations on the scheduler uh, context switch fast path uh, because it's frowned from, from upon by the scheduler maintainers for very good reasons. So here's a benchmark with Hackbench that shows a significant uh, overhead that a, I would say, uh, uh, simplistic implementation brings. So without any further optimization, running the Hackbench uh, workload, uh, if we look uh, in a per thread mode, uh, we can see we have 46% uh, uh, overhead, uh, which is fairly notice noticeable uh, on, the, on the Hackbench uh, benchmark. So it's not visible for the per process Hackbench, neither is it for uh, 10 processes each per thread. So my, my guess there is that the context switch overhead, that includes a switch MM, um, switching between memory space between threads belonging to two different processes, uh, is much more expensive than the atomic operation. So maybe that's why we don't see it, but maybe I just did not find the right workload to get it to show up. Because the, the other cases, I mean, the difference is not significant. Uh, for perf bench, uh, I ran again. So on all the perf bench workload I've run so far, I could not figure a, a significant overhead uh, difference uh, with the, again, uh, simplistic implementation, where I, I basically add the atomic bit test and set and the atomic bit clear uh, to the scheduler fast path. But again, I might just not have found the right workload. So that's an open call to especially Google who use that in the field or on their workload to provide benchmarks uh, of their TC Madoc adapted to, to this patch set. Um, so uh, then, okay, so a, a few words about the approach on opt-in or always on uh, for the for this uh, VCPU ID field. So considering the impact on the scheduler performance, the approach that Google uh, has take, have taken uh, in their internal implementation, as far as I know, is to make the VCPU ID allocation opt-in per process. But given that my goal is to have glibc use that for its memory allocator all the time, I mean, being opt-in maybe will help, but as for now, but as soon as glibc will be updated, no, everyone, everyone's gonna opt in, every process, almost. So I don't see it as a good approach to tackle performance over red issues. So what I want to uh, rather do is to make sure that the, uh, the, the performance impact is really as minimal as possible. Uh, so here's what I did. I created, uh, I identified, uh, specific scenarios which are extremely common and I uh, did performance improvement on them. The first one, it's the single threaded memory space. So you have a process with a single thread. Many processes in the system are single threaded. Well, the solution there, well, put it simply is to just return zero. I mean, you have a single thread, can, it can use bucket zero, right? Uh, on Numa, it's a bit different uh, because, I mean, yeah, that can be a constant for each Numa node because I I'll talk more about Numa later, but I want Numa to make sure that every CPU ID that is returned or vir virtual CPU ID that is returned, its association with the current Numa node stays invariant for the lifetime of the process, just as if it was a real CPU. 
unless there's a new method topology change, but that almost never happens. So, uh, and if it happens, well, user space will, should deal with it and update whatever they, they, they have allocated or, yeah, or, or be slower. Yeah. Um, scheduling between threads from the same MM. Okay, so that's a workload where you have one process with many threads and you basically schedule around between threads that belong to this same process. So th for this use case, which is quite common, uh, just ending over. So, so you all allocate a vCPU ID, let's say five. Okay, so I'm this thread, I have vCPU ID five. I'm context switching out this thread and I notice that I'm going to a thread that belongs to the same MM. I just can take this value five without pu putting it back into the bitmap and I just give it to the next thread. It belongs to it now. So that's easy. And that's fast. So, and those two are trivial to do. So those come without question. I mean, there's no complexity associated. It's the last one that's a bit more complex. So I noticed that for workloads, which are kind of in-betweens, let's say you have a pair of processes, two process, each are multi-threaded, heavily multi-threaded. So you have a mix of the scheduler switching between threads within the same process, but also scheduling between threads of those different processes. So there, none of the two first optimization change anything. You, you basically need to relatively, well, whenever you switch between threads belonging to different processes, you need to take, take the extra atomics. Again, it might not be an issue if we assume that the switch MM, switching between memory space overhead, is large enough compared to the atomics, but I did not want to take any chance, so I created a mechanism. So it's a per run queue cache of pairs of vCPU ID MMs. So I keep, I don't remember, maybe eight or 16 entries, maybe eight, uh, in an array within, a, uh, within each run queue. And it's a cache. And then basically, whenever I run out of space, I just kick out the oldest one. Uh, so, uh, so that takes care uh, of the, the, the case where you have multi-process, multi-threaded. So I confirmed my approach with, uh, so, so within my patch set, I added uh, uh, SketchStats instrumentation uh, of all the various paths, so all the lookups, of the cache, all the eviction, the discard, uh, the, the case of transfer between threads, which is the other optimization I discussed for uh, the single process uh, multi-threaded case. The single threaded vCPU ID, so that's the passing over between two threads belonging to the same uh, process. Then the vCPU ID allocation, uh, the bit set, so that's the exp expensive one. Uh, and then on release MM and migration, the bit clear that uh, that's required. So I instrumented uh, all this with uh, the sked stats, getting counters, and here's the result. With the perf bench, sked messaging, single instance, multi-process. So you end up with um, the single threaded VCPU ID is almost all the time uh, what is hit. I mean, there's other things running in the system, right? So I might have a few applications that are also multi-threaded, but I mean, they're in the noise. But uh, so it hits pretty well. Then, and this is uh, the this is run in a loop. So maybe I don't know, ten thousand times or something like that. Then for sked switch, uh, then sorry for the uh, perf uh, the messaging perf uh, bench uh, uh, benchmark. This one is multi-threaded. So as you see, the first optimization almost never hits. The second one, transferring between threads, it's almost all the time. And then a few run queue cache hit. Then uh, we have, so this is uh, two instances of multi-threaded uh, perf bench get messaging. So this case is really, you have two processes, each is multi-threaded and so as you can see here, the transfer between threads, it's 
pretty often. So it looks like the scheduler is pretty often scheduling between threads within the same process. But yet, yet you see around 10% of run queue cache hit. So that optimization is doing some good. Um, well, I mean, it does not say whether the code implementing the lookup is actually faster than an atomic. That's something that we would have to verify uh, separately. Uh, and then uh, for the perfvent sked pipe, one instance, multi process. Again, it's the single threaded VCPU ID that it's exactly all the time. So we don't even have to do the atomics in this case ever. So um, for ActBench, with the so so I, I recall the benchmarks I showed a, a few slides earlier where we add a significant overhead with the per thread hack bench. So in with the optimizations in place, the the per thread hack bench, then the in this case now the the difference is not not significant. The the overhead is not significant of the of the feature. Uh, question over there. Uh, do you, do you want Mike? How many threads does that CPU have? So, uh, okay, it's not, it's really far from the perfect machine for taking benchmarks, okay? Uh, because I, I learned that I was going to give this talk three days ago. Uh, so it's a 16 core machine, but it has hyper-threading enabled and I was traveling so I could not easily disable it. Uh, and it's running in a VM, but the VM, uh, uh, so KVM, uh, but it, uh, it's NUMA as well, but the NUMA uh, uh, topology is replicated in the KVM. So that's what it is. So, you can so you're executing 32? Uh, yeah, that would be a logical, uh, logical core visible from user spaces 32, yes. All right, and, and you have 10 groups using 40, so are you, how many, is, you're executing 10 on, on 64, right? I uh, would guess so. I mean, I mainly run Agbench without specifying, specifying any option in this case, other than dash T for the per thread. Uh, so whatever it, I don't, I, I have not looked again at what it auto check on the system and whether it scales its workload to the number of visible logical cores. I, 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 I won't go in this because I'd have to look up the documentation again at this point. But I mean, for me, the important thing was to compare a B comparison of baseline compared to the workload I'm applying. And, and, and certainly I could run that on another machine I have, which is all set up for uh, more precise benchmarking. And maybe some of the cases that are in the noise here could end up not being in the, no in the noise and we could see a difference, but I just did not have the time to set that up in three days. Yeah, I think you'd need to do a sweep across multiple uh, thread counts to see what happens here. And I, I, you said you use a bit field, but it's only the maximum of the uh, core count, correct? Yes. So what happens if you go over that in a per task thread count? If you go over what? The number of CPUs. Say, for instance, I wanted to run 40 threads. Oh yeah, that's okay. Uh, okay, what happens is the scheduler is not going to schedule. So you have 32 run queues. You can run at most concurrently 32 threads, never more. So you're limited to uh, zero to 31. You, you can never have to allocate VCPU ID 32, right? 31 is the last one because you allocate one per run queue and you have 32 run queue on your system. So what does that thread get? It, what does, sorry? What is it, so I have, I have more than that scheduled to run, what happens in your code? The MM struck, like you're, you're handing out one per bit field and the bit field's full. No, so, so you say you have, you have 40 threads, right. 32 cores, right? Yes. Okay, so the scheduler, let's say it may, may have two threads in the first run queue, one, two, I don't know, so it does, certain number of threads per run queue, but the number, uh, the, the currently active threads, there's only one. The currently running is so one when, per run So queue. when a thread uh, goes to sleep, you remove the 
vCPU ID. I actually put it in the vCPU ID cache in the run queue. I, I could put it back into the bitmap, but that would cost me an atomic dec dec uh, bit clear. So rather than that, I just put it in the, in the vCPU ID cache in the run queue. And so what does that cache do when, when the process wakes back up? You look up in the cache for the process by something else? Oh, so when, when is it looked up or? Yeah, when you retrieve the uh, vCPU ID. Yes. So the vCPU ID is retrieved from that run queue whenever we have another thread. So on that run, on, on that CPU, on that run queue, whenever there's another thread belonging to the same MM that want to be context switched in. So rather than immediately trying to go and allocate a bit from the bitmap, it's going to check, is there an entry available in the cache? If yes, I just take it. It's mine. Okay. Uh, don't you have to lock the cache too then? No, I, I'm in the scheduler. So there's already the run queue lock taken. So what does it matter if you're setting a bit field or, or taking one from the cache? What's the difference? What, sorry? What does it matter if you're setting a bit in the bit field because it's already protected versus taking one from the cache? No, the bit field is in the struct MM, which is shared across all cores and all run queues. So for the, for the bit field, you need the atomic because it's shared between cores, but the run queue is per core and thus already protected by the run queue lock. I see. So the, the vCPU ID is just a single vCPU ID recorded? Uh, sorry? The vCPU ID is just one recorded for that particular run queue? Yeah, I mean, it happened to, uh, to take one, so it has it. So let's, let's keep it around a bit until, let's say, okay, the, the cache gets, let's say, overwritten. And then at this point, okay, we, we need to remove, to clear it, right? Okay, thank you. Welcome. Good questions, by the way. Uh, so uh, more be be benchmark uh, from Perf Bench. So again, it did not show any significant uh, overhead before with the simplistic implementation. It still does not show any significant overhead with this implementation with the optimizations in place. So for more benchmarks, I would kindly ask Google to share benchmarks covering execution of their workload with and without the vCPU ID patch. And I might even apply a patch on top of my code or modify my code to make the, um, the optimizations that I do uh, uh, configurable. So maybe that they can easily disable the optimizations and, and do the, the testing with each or especially with and without the last one, which is more complex, the, 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 the per run queue uh, vCPU ID cache. Uh, because I'm, I mean, if, if it does not show any uh, significant performance gain, I mean, let's, let's rip it apart. I mean, it, it's, it's neat, but yeah, it, it needs to serve a, a purpose. Um, I also want to see what are the performance benefits for TC malloc. Uh, so uh, they have the code in TC malloc to wire up their uh, internal uh, vCPU ID uh, code. Uh, so they, they could change it to try it out with my patch set. And I, I'd like to see how it behaves. Uh, how it behaves. Um, yeah, okay, so I already talked about that. So Numa now, and let's see how I'm doing for time. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm doing fine. Numa, uh, Numa is an interesting beast. Uh, my design assumption for Numa is that it should really be only an optimization which works as is, although less efficiently, without any code change in user space when user space is not Numa aware. Uh, compared to what I've seen from the, the, the comments in the header from TC malloc where I, I kind of think that they, if they want to do the, to deal with Numa uh, in the way they expose it, they, they kind of need to change the code to, in order to really take into account that, oh, it's Numa or it's not Numa. So the way I did it, I pushed a bit of the complexity at the kernel level to make it uh, very simple to use in user space. 
So the guarantee that is needed here, in my opinion, is, uh, is to be similar to what a real CPU ID provides with respect to its pneuma technology, uh, topology, sorry. So that the mapping between a CPU number and its pneuma node ID stays invariant unless there's a pneuma topology change. So in this case, so, so whenever you get, let's say a CPU number, you look, oh, it's pneuma node two. So you can allocate from pneuma node two. And then whenever you index your per CPU uh, data structures uh, by a CPU number, uh, you, you stay on pneuma node two whenever you do the access. So the, the access, the ones that do the access do it from the same pneuma node as the ones that uh, uh, reserve the memory, allocated the memory. So um, the guarantees I want to provide for the MM vCPU ID is that for the lifetime of a process, the mapping between vCPU ID and pneuma node ID stay invariant unless there is a new topology change in the kernel. So it's pretty much the same thing I want to provide as a guarantee. So that, that vCPU ID should stay associated with that same NUMA node. So, um, so the use case there is to allow allo allocating NUMA local memory on first use of a vCPU ID. So the first time a thread within a process observes a vCPU ID number, should be able to ask the kernel to allocate new molecule memory. Uh, and then all the following accesses uh, from this VCPU ID should be new molecule. Um, so I'd, all I do that uh, is to expose an additional node ID field in StructRSec in addition to the MM VCPU ID. And then I use a RSec uh, critical section to load both fields atomically with respect to uh, migration uh, so that we, we are guaranteed that we indeed have a, a, a pair that will be invariant every time both are read. So, uh, and, and actually reading both is only needed when you do the original allocation that needs to be on this specific NUMA node number. In the other cases, when you want to do the accesses, you want to be statistically on the right pneuma node number, but if it turns out that you might not be or whatever, it's not the end of the world. Of course, if you do that from within a RSEC critical section, we handle the abort for you and everything, so that's gonna be fine. But I mean, it can also uh, be used for uh, situations uh, where you're not using it from a RSEC critical section. Um, okay, internally, what I did is to implement that by adding the following bitmaps uh, to each MM. Each bitmap, their max number of bits is still a uh, number of possible uh, CPUs. So there's one bitmap per NUMA node, which I call the vCPU ID allocation bitmap. And one more, which is a bitmap that keeps track of overall what has been uh, allocated in terms of IDs. So overall what we have, we have one bitmap that we had before, uh, which is not really, is not for NUMA, it's in all the cases, we have this bitmap that keeps track of what are the IDs that are currently in use in the process. This bitmap is still valid and this is really the, the one with the test and set and everything that defines, okay, this ID is reserved and given to a thread at the moment. These other bitmaps allow us to figure out whenever we want to, so, so whenever we need to uh, allocate an ID, we will want to reuse IDs that have been provided for this, the NUMA node on which we currently are. So it keeps track of, it keeps track of all the, 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 the vCPU IDs that, are, that have been given in the past in the past for each NUMA node. And then the last one, the, um, the allocation bitmap, it just keeps track of in the past history of this process, which of the IDs were at all allocated. So with all this information, what I can do, so I actually ex extended the find first operations that we have on CPU masks uh, to uh, add two new ones. 
So CPU mask find zero and zero, and CPU mask find one and zero. And this allows me to scan two bit mask in parallel. So, and basically I, I can look at the current human node bit mask and the allocation uh, and the currently used mask. And I need to find the first one, which has been previously allocated for my new node, but is not currently in use. And then when I find it, I can do the test and set on the, uh, on the used mask. If I get it, perfect, then I use it. If I, if I cannot find any, then I need to allocate a new one. Then I use, um, uh, I, I use the, the last mask, the, alloc the previously allocated mask. I scan it to, to see what is the first one that was not previously allocated and is not in use, which then I can go and allocate and use. So that's, uh, that's how it works. Uh, yeah, so the updates to those NUMA specific bitmaps, they only need to be done the first time a vCPU ID is allocated for a memory space. All the fast paths are lookups. They, they're just scanning bit, bitmaps, reading word by word, trying to find the first pair that we are looking for. So there are some open questions, some of which I've uh, had the chance to discuss over IRC today with uh, Peter Zistra, um, uh, because he was not sure he could make it at this time of the, of the day. Uh, so uh, one of the questions I had for uh, was, should the scheduler use uh, per NUMA no, no uh, VCPU ID allocation bitmap uh, to take it into account with, when taking migration decisions? So, so it's based on uh, discussions with uh, uh, the Google guys where it turns out they did not, so, so they have some code to do um, NUMA aware VCPU ID, but they don't turn it on. And they, they claim that they have better benchmarks when they, they don't enable it. And I kind of wonder whether it's caused by scheduler decision about uh, where it, it migrates or, or, or places new threads when they are created and whether there would be a gain to have no, to use knowledge about where uh, where there are uh, vcpu ids available uh, to 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 spawn those threads rather than just uh, spawn them let's say on a on a numa node where there's been no data structures allocated on that numa node yet so i mean those are open questions can i just quickly interject matthew so for the per NUMA, like using the VCPU ID when, de when determining whether to migrate a task between NUMA nodes, it seems useful, but the whole mechanism for determining where to migrate pages between NUMA nodes and then where to put tasks to have better locality, I feel like it's just kind of a constant, you know, back and forth game that the sched that the CPU scheduler plays with the memory sched, the memsched logic. So I almost wonder if we want to like take a step back and think about a more general approach, like could this plug into you know, like the watermark logic where we figure out which pages to uh, to demote to like slower NUMA node, slower memory tiers and stuff like that, instead of having it kind of be like a side, another like variable and kind of the decision for the, the game that they play, if that makes sense. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, possibly, but yeah. I don't know, okay. <laughs> should be looked into. Uh, another question I had mainly for Peter was uh, whether, so currently what I'm doing is I extend the size of struct mm to add those bit, bit uh, map at the end. And the size does not seem to be uh, such an issue, uh, at least for, uh, for Peter. Uh, but the alternative would be to add a pointer to struct mm to point to my data structure, but then you get an extra pointer de reference on the scheduler fast path. So, I mean, Peter is more to, in the opinion of uh, extending the struct mm size. Uh, so, uh, and then open idea, maybe my, that the, the cache idea for the per run queue cache that I did could be reused to cache uh, the uh, mm user references as well. So, uh, and uh, yeah, the, the active mm concept in the kernel where there's ref counting and uh, so there, there's a, there's been quite a bit of discussion on how to improve things there uh, performance wise uh, in the community uh, in the recent years. And maybe that's one approach to keep it in mind, to just kind of keep that reference in a cache in the run queue uh, until either it gets get kicked out or get re gets reused. 
Uh, currently, the kernel does something relatively similar to that. Whenever the scheduler schedules a kernel thread, it kind of keeps an active MM reference until, just because a common case is then to schedule back to a thread belonging to the same MM. So, so it just never releases that reference. But here what I do is I kind of generalize, general, generalize that to be able to kind of handle keeping more than one. So, so it's a cache of a few entries that you can keep references around. So I don't know, maybe it could help, maybe not. Um, so I would like to make this available for uh, shared memory as well per container. Uh, I'm going to uh, discuss that at the containers micro conference. So you're welcome to come there. Here are the references. And I think we have a bit of time for discussion. Uh, yeah, four minutes. Double-checking whether I did understand something. Um, if, let's say, VCPU ID 2 has been on node 5, does that mean that VCPU ID 2 will always be on node 5? The only exception is on PowerPC, because they support a dynamic reconfiguration of the new topology. That's the only exception I know. Uh, so it can change. So user space should not abort, ideally, should. Yeah, but uh, but yeah. Other than that, it's it's going to stay the same. Regarding uh, regarding power PC, there is no reconfiguration of the new topology that cannot happen. Well, it's Outlook that does it. Right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. But in that case, this is better to keep the CPU ID at, attached to the node, even if that node is no more existing. Ideally, because, yes, but yeah, because from user space application web cases where we are doing. Uh, Migration that's changed the new topology, but the kernel cannot reflect the topology the hypervisor is exposing, and we have to. We we can do a, a hot plug of CPUs to realign, but for the user space application, they don't like to see the CPU IDs migrating from one node to another one. That's uh, something they want, don't, don't want to see, and I think that's better to keep that wired in some way. Yeah, but I mean. I I, I expose the, the current node ID and I expose this VCPU ID number. I mean, what, what happens to, uh, to the mapping between them is a result of, uh, I mean, I, mean I, I have a limit as well. I have a limit of the number of possible Correct. cores. And because of that limit, in the rare cases where there would be a topology change, I need to go and do stealing of the of yeah, CPU ID from one node to the other. I agree. That's the problem. Yeah, I agree. That's may happen. That's yeah. But I think we, we we will have to extend the number of CPU IDs inside the kernel to to get higher numbers. But the bitmap will be lighter. Yeah, but I mean, so far I think PowerPC is the only architecture that has this weirdness. I'm not aware of any other other. But I think you can get it also with key VM migrating VM from one node to another one. Maybe. I mean, this is definitely something to, to, to look into, but uh, yeah. yeah. That's a mess. I agree. <laughs> Other questions? Don't have any online questions, so I think maybe that's it. Yeah, thank you very everyone. Uh, have a great evening and thanks for listening to my talk.